So as Al had said, we are in a series, if you've been coming the last few weeks, we looked at the gifts that Jesus, we're looking at the gifts that Jesus has given to equip the church. We looked at the gift of the prophet. And this month, we're looking at the gift of the evangelist. And an evangelist is someone who is called to equip the church to announce good news, to announce good news. Now, an announcement is no good if it's misleading, if it leads to confusion. Have a look at this notice that was put up on the stairwell of a student hall of residence. um, The intention was good. Have a look. (laughs) It kind of looks reasonable, doesn't it? (laughs) But you can imagine the chaos that ensued as people tried to stand on the right as they were going up and on the left as they were going down. It led to confusion because the announcement was not clear. Now, I know that when I'm a little bit confused about the gospel message, then I tend not to share it with boldness and confidence. So my hope is that as we look at the gospel together today, our confidence and our excitement will grow. I remember as a teenager, I was in this little group of young people Uh, We would meet and study the Bible with great enthusiasm. And I remember one occasion, we sat in someone's living room, and uh, somebody opened the Scriptures for us, and we looked at a verse, 1 Peter 3.15, which goes like this. You must worship Christ as Lord of your life, and if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it, but do this in a gentle and respectful way. And then to my horror, the leader of the discussion said, let's just go around and let's see, what would you say if somebody asked you to explain your hope in the gospel? And I realized I hadn't got a clue. I could do the gentle and respectful bit, but actually what was this hope, this gospel hope that I had? How would I explain it? I'd heard evangelists do it, and they do a great job. I could never do it. That's what I thought. Well, I don't know about you, Do you feel confident that you could give a clear reason for what you believe if someone was to ask you? You see, the gospel is the greatest story ever told. The greatest story ever told. But can we tell it? Can we actually express it in a way that makes sense to our friends? Now, maybe, I'm sure there are some of you out there who are very good at it and love sharing the good news of Jesus. But I suspect there's many of us who feel a little bit uncertain about how to communicate this message that's changed our lives. How do we communicate it to others? Well, thankfully, God has given us the Holy Spirit. And one of the reasons he's given us the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, is so that we could be witnesses. That means people who point others to Jesus, that we could be witnesses in our own hometown, and even to the ends of the earth. The Holy Spirit has been given to us to help us to tell people about Jesus. And the Holy Spirit's going to help us today. He's going to help me as I try to explain this, thank God, and help you as you take it on board. And the aim is that we can communicate clearly this hope that we have and avoid the confusion of things like that notice that we looked at. And I believe if we're clear and confident about the gospel message, three things are going to happen. One, it's actually going to strengthen our own relationship with God. When we talked about doing this series on evangelism and the the gift of the evangelist, I spoke up and said, I think we need to do one Sunday explaining what the gospel is. And I said that because I was a little confused myself. And I was hoping that someone who's really good at this sort of thing could explain it to me. (laughs) Anyway, I got the job. (laughs) But it's done me good. I am actually much more excited now, having sort of dug into this theme. I'm excited about my own relationship with God and what Jesus has done for us, and I hope you will be too. Secondly, I believe that it'll help us as a church to serve Jesus more faithfully when we're a bit clearer about what he came to do for us. So it'll strengthen us as a church, but of course, the third thing It'll make it much easier for us to talk about Jesus with those around us when we're clear and confident in the message. 
So, are we good so far? Let's dive in. What is the gospel? Now, if you were to ask somebody in Derby, what do you think the gospel is? Some of them might think, oh, it's a type of music. Gospel music. I love gospel music. Great. Someone else might say, ah, gospel truth. It means something that's really true, which is okay. But actually, that's not the point. The word gospel, it's an old English word that basically means good news. God spell. Spell was the old word for news, apparently. So good news, very simple. And there's three things that we need to know about good news. Are you ready? Firstly, good news means that something has happened. It's news. Something good has happened. Secondly, that means that something good is going to happen as a result. So something good has happened, and something good is going to happen as a result, which means that life in between is now different. Let me give you an example. I was out the other day with Karina and uh, scrolling on my phone, as you do when your partner's on her phone, and, um, <laughs> and something popped up. <laughs> <laughs> Something popped up on my phone that caught my attention. It news flash. Liverpool declared as winner. And I thought, aha, maybe they've beaten Everton. Maybe this is an opportunity for some banter for me to have a go at Allard. Or maybe they've beaten Man United and I can have a go at Sanjay. But no, it was something else. This was part of a bigger story. And when I clicked on it, I remembered the story. Of course, you know what it's about. What was it about? Eurovision. Liverpool had beaten Glasgow in the bid to host the Eurovision in, I think, May the 13th next year. So, good news. At least that's if you enjoy Eurovision and you live in Liverpool. Very bad news if you're in Glasgow and you like Eurovision or if you hate the Eurovision. But anyway, something had happened, which meant something good was going to happen. That in May next year, there's going to be a huge party in Liverpool. Are you going? <laughs> Actually, we're going to host a party here. At least that's our plan. We'll have it up on the screen. We're going to have a great party. It'll be fun. Something good had happened. Something was going to happen, which meant for those who are like really interested in this, something needed to happen now. We've got to book tickets. We've got to plan. We've got to be there. You know, we're going to start planning because something has changed good news. Well, this word for good news in the language of the Bible is euangelion. And this word meant a lot in the Roman Empire in the days when Jesus and his disciples were walking the earth. That's because an announcement had recently gone off across the Roman Empire, and it was a huge announcement. You see, there had been a massive civil war in the Roman Empire between Octavian, who became Caesar Augustus. Octavian had been in a civil war with Mark Antony. And there'd been this 13 years of fighting across the Mediterranean, and people in every city were thinking, oh, which side are we on? Who do we back? I mean, we think it's bad in Westminster. This, imagine that going on for 13 years. Turmoil. And there was this huge battle, navy battle, and Octavian's navy beat Mark Antony, who later on died, and then the news went across the Roman Empire. Good news, euangelion, Augustus Caesar has won a great victory, peace and prosperity is coming to the empire. So, an announcement of a great victory, which meant that something was going to happen, it took two years of mopping up operations before he rode into Rome and was announced the great Caesar and emperor. Now, that meant something very important in the meantime, because it depended, of course, who were you backing? King Herod, who we're familiar with from the Bible stories, he had sided with Mark Antony, which meant that once the news came out, he had to do some thinking. He had to repent he had to wake up and smell the coffee, which is what he did. He went straight to Caesar Augustus and said, Augustus, and he probably threw himself on the ground. He says, I have been such a loyal supporter and friend to Mark Antony, which means I will be a very loyal, faithful friend and supporter of you. 
which actually worked. And he was reinstated as the king of Palestine and everything went okay for him. So that was what they understood by euangelion, an announcement of good news in the Roman Empire. But interestingly, this word also meant an awful lot to Jews, to people who knew their Old Testament, because this was a really big word in the Bible. Let me explain. It's, it's actually the announcement that Jesus made when he first stepped onto the stage of history and began his public ministry. This is what he announced. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Something has happened. Something's going to happen. So we need to respond now. And this had been prophesied hundreds of years before by some of the great prophets, particularly Isaiah, who talks quite a lot about the good news. And what he was saying was that the people of God, we've blown it. We haven't fulfilled the covenant that God gave with us. We haven't stepped into our role. But good news is coming because God himself is coming to earth and he's going to set everything straight. He's going to send his Messiah, an anointed king who will bring peace, forgiveness, restoration, not only to God's people, but to the whole world. That's what Alid Psalm was about, that he was just reading there, Psalm 2. I have set my king on my holy mountain. God had got a king lined up. We can read about that in many places in Isaiah. Isaiah 52 verse 7 says, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, proclaiming peace, bringing good tidings, proclaiming salvation, who say to Zion, Your God reigns. This is what the gospel message... You know, I used to think the gospel message was really all about me. And I've realized it's not. It's about God and about God's kingdom. And of course, each of us has a part to play in that. The gospel writers make it clear that Jesus is this long-awaited Messiah, King of Israel, the true Lord of the whole world who brought the reign of God through his life, his death, and his resurrection. And this is the news that Paul and others began to announce across the Roman world. Remember, this is the Roman world that's just been hearing, Augustus Caesar is Lord, good news. And now Paul and the others are saying, Jesus, the Messiah, is Lord, good news. Bit of a clash of kingdoms going on there, isn't there? Something has happened. A great victory has been won. Jesus, through his death, has defeated, taking upon himself, he's defeated sin, the power of sin. He's defeated the power of Satan and evil. He's even defeated the power of death through his sacrificial, atoning death on the cross. He's taken it all, taken it on, and he's won. And then his resurrection means that not only has something good happened, but it's a foretaste that something very good is coming because it's the beginning of new creation. Jesus rose up in a glorious new body as the first fruit of what will happen for all of us who trust in him, that we'll be raised again. And not just us, but the whole world is going to be made new. And goodness me, don't we need that hope at the moment when the world is in turmoil and we're looking around and we see dictators and we see famine and floods and wars and horrors all around us. We think, God, is this going to go on forever? And the good news says, no, that there is an end to suffering and God is going to make all things new through Jesus. He will return in glory and Jesus is Caesar. Not, sorry, Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. Let's get that the right way around. <laughs> Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. So something good has happened. Something good is going to happen. And what does that mean? Well, that's decision time for everyone in the meantime. Life can now be completely different. That is at the heart of the good news. We need to wake up 
and smell the coffee. Or in the Bible language, that means we need to repent. Now, this was a totally different kind of king and kingdom to anything the world had seen before. We're used to dictators. We've got a few of them around at the moment. They're not very nice. They're not kind. They're not just. But look at the kind of kingdom that Jesus brought. It was a kingdom built on self-giving love. It was a victory won through a humiliating death. It's a kingdom of truth, humility, and justice. Something the world hadn't seen before. And it rocked the ancient world. And yet such a strange message to preach. Imagine you're Paul or one of his other disciples And you go into a Roman marketplace and you announce, good news, there's a new king on the throne. He died a terrible death on a cross, a humiliating death. How's that going to go down? Well, Paul's very honest about how it goes down. He says in 1 Corinthians 1, 23, when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended And the Gentiles, the non-Jews, say it's all nonsense. But to those who are called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ and the gospel message is the power of God and the wisdom of God. And this foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans. And God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. And what Paul found is when he stood up and proclaimed this crazy, foolish message, for many people, something happened. Lights would go on. Not only did they believe his message, they encountered Jesus, and they received his love. They were born again. It's as though suddenly the curtains were drawn back, and they saw it was daylight, and the world began to make sense in a new way. That's what happens to us when we believe this crazy message. It is the power of God for salvation for all who believe. So if you feel a little uncomfortable sharing the message of the gospel with people, you're in good company because Paul probably felt uncomfortable about it too. It does sound like nonsense in many ways to the world and yet it is the message that brings life and hope and is doing that across the whole world. Isn't that awesome? So we can see that the gospel is news Are we doing okay? Yeah? The other thing I wanted to say is that it really is good news. The first thing I want to say about that is that the gospel is good news for us about God. People have all sorts of ideas about what God is like, and often they're quite negative ideas, aren't they? I think about Iran at the moment. People are fed up with religion, and they're probably fed up with what they've been told about God. But if they only knew what God was really like, And that's why Jesus came. He said to Philip, Philip, one of his disciples, said, Lord Jesus, show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. And Jesus said, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father, has seen God. Now that's radical. That means that God is like Jesus, as Jesus is the embodiment of who God is. Now that is good news because when Jesus stood up in Nazareth, he said, I've come to proclaim the good news to the poor, freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free. That is the heart of our God. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, not the year of the Lord's anger, He's a God of love and mercy. He's the God of utter, self-giving love. So, the gospel is good news. It's good news about God. But of course, it's also good news for you and for me. The truth is that we've all resisted God in various ways. We've resisted him. We've not walked in truth and honesty, and love. We deserve to be cut off from God. And that's how we were living before we heard the gospel. We were trapped in our sin and oppressed 
by our enemy. And yet, through his death, Jesus has brought us forgiveness and freedom. Forgiveness and freedom. We're made new. We can begin to live for him. We can enjoy his wonderful love. Paul writes, There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Just think about that for a moment. No fear of judgment. No fear of the future. We've been adopted into his family. Jesus actually, it says in the beginning of John's gospel, if we believe, then we have the right to become children of God, adopted. He loves us and he will never let us go, adopted into his family. It's good news for you and for me. And we find a new purpose for life. But thirdly, the gospel is good news for the world. And don't we need to hear that? God's bringing his wonderful kingdom of justice and peace. Everything will be made wonderfully new. Now, you might say to me, oh, Adam, it doesn't look like that at the moment. But Jesus said that the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. It grows along the ground. It sprouts and grows, and it's almost unseen until one day you realize it's filled the whole garden. We've got some weeds like that in our garden. You don't notice them, and suddenly you look, and they're everywhere. Well, the gospel is like good seed of a good weed that's spreading. And behind the scenes, God's people are bringing healing and love and justice and God's goodness into some of the darkest places of the world. We don't see it on the news, but it's going on. God's kingdom is coming more and more. And one day he will arrive and the whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of the goodness of God. So, that's the good news. How do we communicate such a strange and yet urgent announcement? It may seem scandalous and foolish. I sometimes wonder, how much of this message do I need to explain to somebody so that they can be saved? Because I, actually, as I've looked into the gospel message, I've realized it's much bigger and broader even than I thought. There's so much we could say. There are so many facets to this beautiful diamond. Well, think back to when you first heard and believed the good news. Did you understand the whole thing? I know I didn't. I think I understood that he died so I could be forgiven and I could have a relationship with God. I think it was about as simple as that. Maybe for you it was hearing that your Father in heaven loved you and that was enough. Maybe it was an encounter with Jesus or a dream. God is able to reveal himself in so many ways. So be encouraged, first of all, that we're actually working with God when we step out. We've heard prophetically today that God is saying that there is a green traffic light for us. He wants us to begin to step out, not to hold back, but to step out. And as we do that, the Holy Spirit is at work. So even if we stumble over our weak attempt to explain who Jesus is or what he's done for us, the Holy Spirit is at work in your friend's heart, taking your words, taking them deep, and bringing new life. It's a miracle. It's supernatural. It doesn't depend on us getting it all right. Praise God. Secondly, Jesus is alive today. You're not introducing a philosophy or someone who's dead. Jesus really, really wants to be introduced to your friend. Now, I'm sometimes not very good at doing introductions. I kind of get a bit stumble over, this is so-and-so, and this is so and Anyway, it's just wonderful when they begin to talk to each other, and they, they get on like a house on fire and think, great, I can step back. Well, the fact is, Jesus is just waiting to meet your friends. And once you've made the introduction, he's in there. He will be right alongside them. And thirdly, let me just encourage you that we're doing this together. Our friend Gary Gibbs, who's a national evangelist, used to say, Fishing is a team activity. We used, Jesus said that we're supposed to be fishers of men, but he didn't mean sitting by a, a river or a pond with a fishing rod. It was about a bunch of mates with nets getting out together. And you know, this wonderful group of people here, we are together a sign of the gospel. The fact that we are here together as friends, as family from many nations is a sign that Jesus is alive and the gospel is powerful. And the work that we do 
through the week as we serve the poor, as we reach out to those who need help, is a sign of the gospel. And as we have community and fellowship together, as we love one another, Jesus says, the world will know that you are my disciples, our family, together. We're doing the work of the gospel. Now, I had a strange thing happen to me this week. I had a dream. I often having dreams from the Lord. And this time, I woke up. It was Friday morning. I woke up. And I'd been dreaming this weird thing. I'd been dreaming that in our bedroom, we had a little pet, little black duck. <laughs> little duck. And it was flapping around the room. And we'd been keeping it in this like bowl in a hanging basket thing. And I'd looked in the bowl and the water had run out and the duck was hungry. And I woke up thinking, well, that was weird. But I was also thinking, ducks are not supposed to live in your bedroom. <laughs> anyway, that was weird enough. And I wrote in my journal, oh, you know, dream about black duck in my bedroom shouldn't be in the house. Well, weird thing happened yesterday. There was a bit of a commotion. The cat brings in a little black moorhen from the pond across the way. The moorhen gets away and is running about the kitchen, <laughs> runs into the hall, and we're running after it. Karina's holding the cat, and I'm running after the moorhen. And we managed to open the door, and it went running out of the house and disappeared back to its pond. What was that all about? And then I remembered my dream. And I felt God speak to me. And I think it's something he wants us to get on board. This gospel message is not meant to stay in the house. It's meant to get out. In fact, Bill Johnson used to say, what remains in the house will die in the house. God has given us his life, the life of the Spirit, the good news of Jesus, we're not supposed to hide it under a bucket. We're supposed to be like a city set on a hill, a lamp on a lampstand. Folks, I know it's not easy, and I'm speaking to myself here, but let's let this good news out of the house, amen? amen. That's where God wants it. And I think maybe that's why he sent me that weird dream and that poor little bird had to come into our house. <laughs> So how do we get started? Well, let's get familiar with the good news. And there's maybe a bit of work to be done. Read, read up on the gospel message. Do a course. Thursday night, come to Learning in the Living Room. Get equipped so that you're more confident in how to share the reason why you believe in Jesus. Reflect on how Jesus has changed your life. What would your story be if somebody asked you, why do you believe in Jesus? Just think about it for a bit. You don't have to cover every aspect of the whole gospel message. What was it that captured your heart when you first believed? Was it that offer of forgiveness, a loving father, a life of purpose? And we can trust that God will give us what we need when the opportunity arises to share in that situation. Something else that might help us is we're planning to run an Alpha course in the new year, middle of January. Come along. Come and hear the gospel explained over a few weeks and bring your friends and you can go on a journey together of digging deeper into the good news of Jesus. At the heart of the gospel is not a philosophy. It's not a religion. It's a person. It's a person. 